Hey all, um, I am on call as you can see. I'm stuck in a call room, so excuse the background. Uh, this lecture is going to be on uh, peripheral nerve blocks in the ED. A uh, quick little bite, I am triple boarded nurse anesthesiologist CRNA slash family nurse practitioner slash emergency nurse practitioner. I do probably 85% ER at this point and a little bit of anesthesia thrown in. Uh, peripheral nerve blocks in the ER are an absolute uh, godsend to patients. Uh, many of the EM residency programs are starting to teach them and if you don't learn them you're going to get left behind as with ultrasound as with um, other various things that are coming out. So I hope this um, will spur you into um, attending real ultrasound courses to learn these blocks. They're just simply fantastic and we'll be going over them. So I had open heart surgery uh, about three years ago and my colleagues were making up memes and sending them to me, making me laugh um, with chest tubes and it, it was really kind of mean of them, but um, here's one of them which I got a kick out of. Uh, the objectives, um, I'm not going to bore you with reading everything, but basically I want to introduce you to them, get you thinking about them. Um, they're just simply outstanding in the emergency room for dislocations, fractures, even chronic pain and cancer pain I've used them for and um, we'll go over indications and um, contraindications and hopefully you'll you'll um, you'll see the need and and um, introduce them to your facility so multi-specialty analgesia um, anybody can do these you don't have to be anesthesia you should be it was just anesthesia EM providers palliative care providers and I'm a firm believer in sharing your tools I'll teach anybody how to how to do peripheral nerve blocks. And I've taught some of my colleagues. Um, the rural hospitals I work at are pretty much staffed by NPs um, and occasionally um, a PA here and there, who I think um, all of them, PAs and NPs, do a fantastic job. Family practice traditionally struggles a little bit in the ER because a lot of the times you don't get the um, emergency medicine education and it uh, can be difficult. But this particular aspect of it is easy to get. There's many, many classes, many conferences out there, as well as people who are willing to teach you. Palliative care providers that started moving in the palliative care world. My daughter's a, a EM, or I'm sorry, an IM slash palliative care physician, and she is learning these blocks and starting to do them as well. So again, once you learn them, share your tools, spread the wealth, um, free and open medical education. So why peripheral nerve blocks instead of sedation? Um, sedation has a lot of downsides, especially in the elderly. Um, the benefits of, of getting a nerve block, which is quick, easy to do, provides long-acting analgesia as well as anesthesia for the reduction that you may have to do. Um, minimal or no narcotics. I rarely give narcotics for fractures anymore. No sedation. You don't need to sedate them. Worry about MPO status, aspiration, airway issues. You block them, wait a few minutes, and then they're smiling while you're reducing the fracture or reducing the dislocation. You get some really long-acting analgesia, depending on what you use. Uh, you can use anything from lidocaine up to a long-acting x which is liposomal bupivacaine. Lidocaine short-acting if you just want to do a dislocation of a shoulder, knee, elbow, etc. It wears off very quickly. And from there, you can step up to bupivacaine slash ropivacaine or all the way up to x which will give you up to three days of very profound analgesia. If I do uh, ropivacaine and add some decadron or uh, dexmatomidine, um, I can get a good 36 hours out of it, and it's just awesome. Um, if it's a bone like the um, tibia, which is high risk for compartment syndrome, which I will get into later, um, sometimes I'll do a shorter acting. We have to transfer all our ortho out, and so this gives them an, a pain-free trip. And then once they get down ortho, and the guys down there can decide if they want to. Um, obviously, most times go right to surgery, and then keep up with the blocks after that. Less opioids. Patient, patient satisfaction goes through the roof. I've had little ladies beg me to marry them after doing an ESP block for rib fractures, for instance, and um, they just absolutely love it, and it just so nice watching them smile while you're cranking on their arm um, or cranking on their ankle and it just makes such a world of difference. 
So compartment syndrome, this used to be a thing. Almost all ortho guys are up with, and EM guys are up with it every now and then I'll run into an old timer who hasn't kept up the literature and still believes this. It's kind of an uh, uh, old wives tale. There was a couple instances of compartment syndrome being hidden or suppressed and they thought it was due to regional nerve block. The one instance, it, it was due to a spinal slash epidural, not a peripheral nerve block. And the other instance that happened, the nerve that was um, they claimed was damaged and wasn't even from, didn't even, wasn't even covered by the block. The ortho guy just didn't know it and just blamed it on the, the anesthesia, which um, can tend to happen. But this has pretty much been debunked and debunked very solidly. And again, I'm not going to bore you with the reading everything, so I have a limited amount of time, 30 minutes. Um, so the ACS risk obviously does not prelude, preclude the practice of regional anesthesia. The military has really been in the forefront of this with Afghanistan, um, Iraq, etc. And they've been using them um, a lot for traumatic injuries, traumatic fractures, etc. And just some more data, uh, critical reviews. Um, again, it all has debunked the compartment syndrome and has shown that it's really no um, increased risk with peripheral nerve blocks and delaying diagnosis. Um, the, they actually say it may even help because if you're still having breakthrough pain with a regional analgesic nerve block, then you really should be looking for compartment syndrome. And um, this talks about the uh, one case that um, asserted that a femoral nerve block was responsible for an anterior compartment syndrome. But Again, the anterior compartment is, is, was not supplied by the nerves that were blocked with um, the femoral nerve block. So, again, it's just somebody trying to place blame. And sadly, it's probably caused a lot of patients not to receive um, this benefit. So, talking about some specific fractures, uh, clavicle fractures. I use this um, pretty much on every clavicle fracture I get in. You can also use it for internal jugular insertion, um, abscesses, and it's a superficial cervical plexus block. Very easy to do. You literally take some minutes. If you're um, doing an IJ, you're localizing anyway, you can, and you're using an ultrasound nowadays, you can just pop it here and do a, a superficial cervical plexus block. It's just you know a couple inches um, from the point that you're doing the IJ anyway, and get much better um, analgesia for the procedure. For a clavicle fracture, it provides long-acting analgesia and the patients love it. Recipes I use, uh, 5 to 10 mils of 0.5% ropivacaine. Um, the books say 4 to 10 hours, but if you add um, dexamethasone or a dexmatomidine, then you can get upwards of 36 hours with it. I'd say my average block is good analgesia is 18 to 24 hours. Um, with just dexamethasone added. If you use bupivacaine, uh, 5 to 10 mils, you can use the quarter or half. Um, I like ropivacaine better, but um, some places don't carry it. If you have anesthesia, you almost always have ropivacaine there, though. So, Shoulder and humerus, uh, you know, we get a fair amount of, let me get this out of the way here. We get a fair amount of um, uh, humerus fractures, um, shoulder dislocations, etc. Most of my shoulder dislocations, you can um, they don't really need anything, um, sedation or regional nerve blocks, but on the few they're difficult to reduce. You can consider this or an intraarticular injection. But for humeruses, uh, upper arms, etc., it's very, very nice, uh, long acting analgesia. Again, drugs, dosages, 10 to 15 mils of um, half percent ropivacaine. You can use lidocaine, like for the short-acting procedures, uh, shoulder, shoulder dislocations, or if you're using bupivacaine, you know, 0 0.25, 0 0.5%. Again, the duration, these are what the books say, but uh, but they are definitely longer, uh, again, especially if you use um, uh, dexamethasone with it. And I'm um, a um, firm believer in ropivacaine, as I said before. Arm and hand, um, I like infraclavicular blocks. Supraclavicular is also very easy. Uh, it's called the spinal of the arm. You can get pretty much everything on down. 
interscalings, um, you tend to miss some of the nerves and don't get the hand and distal radial fractures, you, you might miss some things, but with the supra and infraclavicular blocks, there's no issues with that. And um, again, you can see with, with the ultrasound just how easy this is. And uh, this isn't a course on teaching you how to do it, but just trying to get you pointed in the right direction of thinking about maybe it's time to learn how to do them. Uh, 20, 25 cc's, half percent ropivacaine, um, or again, the uh, Marcaine bupivacaine. Um, again, 24 to 36 hours usually. So these offer a much better analgesia um, than an interscaling block and um, truly profound. If you're doing what I'll do, is I'll do the block and then put them up in the hand stirrup with a weight and let them reduce themselves. And they just sit there and it's totally pain free because they're numb. And occasionally you have to do a little manipulation, but a lot of times that will, once it's relaxed and pain free, it just slips back into place and then you can splint right there it just makes it very easy to do. Radius ulna, uh, just talked a little bit about that, supra infra clavicular blocks. You can also do supracondylar radial ulna, ulna medial blocks. Um, I do those more for selective hand injuries. Um, to get the distal radius effectively you really need to block uh, the radial nerve above the elbow. Uh, ulna medial, you know, down the forearm. It's very easy to do. And again, I'll just do, if I have selected fingers or hand injuries, I'll do these for those. I had a, a young girl go to nursing school first year, um, had a ATV accident and basically just mangled her hand, just fingers pointing every which way, degloving, just a horrible injury. Obviously in extreme pain. And I did a, um, a block on her and Literally within 10 minutes, she was pain-free, smiling. The nurse was sitting there while we're waiting for Aravac to picking out pine needles and washing her out. And it's just totally pain-free. It just makes it so much nicer for the patients. Transport pain-free. And um, she was definitely a happy camper. Sometimes I'll do these blocks and I'll actually take them to the OR with a block. And um, I use that uh, for the reductions. And I've had that happen a number of times. A lot of times, though, I'll use a more dilute local anesthetic solution instead of an anesthetic local anesthetic solution. So it's great analgesia, but but not 100% for surgery. So, And um, again, here is um, radial ulnal medial nerve, what they look like and in the forearm. It's very, very easy to do. And um, it's shallow, uh, very easy to find, very easy to place the local around the nerve. Ribs, I'll tell you, I get a, the rib fractures I get in, especially on the older folks, they love um, these blocks. I used to do the stratus plane block, but a few years ago when the erector spinae ESP block came out, I've switched over pretty much um, all the way to that. It's very easy to do. You just sit the patient up. Um, it's You put your transducer on their mid-back and um, slide over a little bit, find the transverse process, dump your local, travels up and down the um, plane, and you get a very uh, dense block. Again, depending on which area you're going through is which is where you want to do the, the ESP block at. And um, for ribs, depending on which ribs are broken, obviously. And um, the nice thing about this, if you do it at T5, for instance, it'll travel up to about T3 and down to about T7. And the same thing for no matter which level you choose to do. And you can do it for abdominal injuries, cancer pains. I had a lady come in with um, end-stage cancer, had a huge mass left side of her abdomen around her spleen, and she was literally on the floor of the registration desk crying, unable to move, just intractable pain. And she's already been on, you know, multiple doses of PO morphine, etc. And um, we carried her and took her in the back and I did a ESP block and literally in 15 minutes she was sitting there smiling at me. We sent her off the pain guys to uh, for consideration of an RF or permanent block. And I heard they did and she had great uh, results from it and, and her palliative care went from taking a bunch of morphine and um, intermittent excruciating pain to being pretty much pain free for the rest of her um, palliative care period. It's truly wonderful. You can see the different things you can use it on. They're using ESP blocks for uh, renal stones in the ER. 
Um, I haven't um, had the opportunity to, to use one yet, but that's on my to-do list. Um, for pancreatitis pain, it's just um, amazing what you can do with this block, and depending where you put it, you can see all the different levels you can put it at as to correspond with what you want to cover. Truly outstanding. Oh, sorry, my mouse has gone crazy. Uh, we talked a little bit about abdominal pathology, and I love the ESP blocks for that. Uh, cancer pain, renal stones, uh, pancreatitis. It's very effective, and again, no narcotic. Um, you can put catheters in. I'm talking e EM, ER stuff, uh, single shot, but you can choose to place a catheter, which is also easily done for longer term um, pain relief, days, etc. And um, even in permanent catheters, but again, those are done by the pain guys. But it works outstanding effects um, on cancer, pain, renal stones, etc. Hip. Femur, um, I used to do a lot of fascia iliaca blocks for them. Now I've gone to pretty much all pain blocks. Very simple, easy to do. This on the screen is a ping block. And um, um, you just drop your needle down here underneath the um, psoas tendon and dump your local anesthetic there and uh, get profound um, analgesia for your hip, upper leg, femur area. Since it's a plain block, you're using a higher dose of local anesthetic, 40 to 60 mils. Um, 0.2% ropivacaine is what I like to do. Uh, sometimes I'll take the 0.5 and mix it half and half to make 0.25 just because that's all we carry here. You can also choose to use 0.25% uh, bupivacaine. And again, these are what the books say, but I've in practice, it's much longer, especially if you add um, dexamethasone or um, uh, dexmetomidine. Uh, same with the ping block, a little bit less. Um, but again, these are very easy to do, very easy to learn, very, very safe. Plain blocks um, are very safe. It doesn't matter if they're anticoagulated, etc. Especially the ultrasound, it just makes this kind of a no-brainer. A popliteal block, a tibia ankle foot, and um, this I do routinely in the ER for ankle fractures, um, lower um, tib fib fractures. And you can do it in a number of positions. If the patient is a fracture, a lot of pain, you can just raise, support their leg, raise it up, put your ultrasound underneath and do it through the side. Or you can turn them on their side. You can do it prone. There's a number of different ways you can do this block. And it's simply fantastic. This is one of the ones I send down to the bigger hospital, the orthopedic um, surgeons, and they'll take the patient the OR. And a lot of times anesthesia doesn't have to do much except some sedation or maybe an LMA if they're going to do a light general. Long-acting analgesia, it is just um, the bomb for patients. And you can see the same uh, local anesthetics. You're well below toxic levels, and I um, recommend, obviously, checking um, weight-based calculations on each patient, which I'm sure you do. If um, on some of these, the popliteal block, you will miss the saphenous, which is the medial um, side of your leg. There's a strip that goes down there. Most times I've found, um, especially the lateral type injuries, you don't really need it. Or maybe a little Toradol covers that little medial portion. But if you do want to add um, saphenous medial coverage, you can do it at adductor canal block. Again, very easy. It takes just a couple minutes in upper thigh. I say the nerve, dump a local, and um, then you get medial coverage along with it. And um, here's an ankle fracture I had not long ago, um, a horrible fracture, and um, totally pain-free reduction. Patient smiling at me, happy, didn't receive any narcotic, and um, ended up shipping, of course, shipped them off to the orthopedic surgeon because we don't have one in our little critical access hospital. And it's nice offering this to the patients. A little critical access hospital, they get this state-of-the-art care that some of the big medical centers don't even offer to their patients in the ER. And here is the ankle fracture. Um, again, I did uh, this one, did a popliteal and an adductor canal block, so I wanted some medial coverage as well, because um, you can see a lot of medial damage there. And here is a um, fracture that I had that I did an interscalene block on. You can see um, fracture upper humerus here. And she did, in fact, she drove um, 
another 11 hours uh, because she was just traveling through and slept on the ice at the, at the gas station. Drove another 11 hours um, to her home and orthopedic consult there. Totally pain free and she was loving life other than knowing what was ahead of her of course. Let me get this out of the way. Superficial cervical plexus block um, for an AC separation. You can see the AC separation up here. Um, very simple dude. You know, takes three, four minutes with an ultrasound. Just dump a little bit of local anesthetic um, up here on the cervical plexuses and totally pain free. Here is um, a distal radius fracture that um, I did not long ago. Did an infraclavicular block and uh, get a pain-free pain reduction. Patient was happy. Uh, put them in the hand stirrups and weights and let them reduce themselves. Again, patient's satisfaction just through the roof. And here it is again, post-reduction. And you can see the cast materials on. You can see the fracture. And of course, I sent them to ortho and they um, finished fixing her, which I just wanted to get in line, which I did in a fairly decent job. SPG blocks. We get headaches in the ER all the time. And this is um, uh, a patient, my wife, who obviously agreed to have her photo. Um, she's the best wife ever. I definitely married up. I'll be the first to admit that. She's also the smart one in our relationship. And um, But in any case, uh, migraine headaches, this is an SPG block. You have hollow Q-tips. You can see the hollow here. And you dip these Q-tips in 4% lidocaine and insert them. If it's a one-sided migraine, you only have to insert one nares. This was a bilateral migraine she had, so I used um, both sides. So you insert these soaked um, Q-tips here and leave them in for around five minutes or so. After I insert them, I will take a 18 gauge needle on a syringe and with local and put down inside this hollow q-tip and drip some more lidocaine. You have to be careful. It is 4% lidocaine. Make sure you stay below the recommended dose for weight. But you can, I usually get about three cc's in and um, truly within two or three minutes a headache is abating and after five minutes usually it's almost totally gone. Zero to one the patients say. Patients love it. Studies show that the more of these you do, the less reoccurrence migraines come. They also recommend these for postural puncture um, headaches, which I have tried a couple times. It works initially, lasts for about 24 hours, and then I end up doing a blood patch anyway. But they do recommend them for postural puncture headaches as well. But for the migraines, this is a bomb. Very simple to do, very easy to do. If you don't have hollow Q-tips, you can just use an IV catheter. Uh, not the needle, of course, and you know, place it in the back and just slowly drip down three, four cc's over a period of time. Doesn't work quite as well, but I have done that when I've been at a place that didn't have these catheters. Now I start taking these with me whenever I cover an ER and unknown facility if they don't have these. Here's a patient I had that used nail gun to um, staple or nail a board through his fingers. And again, it did a selective radial median ulna, peripheral nerve block on him, and it had to work a bit to get this out of him, but finally managed to do it, but he was totally pain-free and a happy man afterwards. So again, my wonderful colleagues trying to make me laugh when I had chest tubes, and um, it um, they thought it was hilarious, me not so much. ESP block again for rib fractures. You can see these rib fractures down here. Let me get this out of the way. Um, you do a, um, again, depending on what level the root fracture is, if I remember right, I did um, a T5 on this patient. Could have gone another level or two lower, but with the high volume, it, it travels down anyway and covers that very well. And um, good pain relief lasts for about 36 hours or so. And on the older patients especially, um, I haven't seen any studies, but I would bet that the incidence of pneumonia, etc., will decrease dramatically. Try to talk fast because I know I only have 30 minutes. Here's another patient I had in. This was a 14-year-old uh, male. Nasty break, as you can see. I did a uh, infraclavicular block and started, or again, used my reduction technique with the wire um, and the weights and just let the arm hang there. Um, the parents loved it. The patient loved it. He thought it was the coolest thing ever. 
and uh, this is post reduction and splinted it, sent him off to ortho and they finished fixing him of course. Uh, it's just fantastic though, no, no scripts for narcotics, no sedation in the ER, no worrying about airway, no worrying about aspiration, MPO status, etc. And um, the patient satisfaction through the roof. Here's another um, fracture. This was on a um, middle-aged lady and uh, did a, um, a um, infraclavicular block on her. And, and actually this one was more of a hybrid because she had a prior clavicle break and surgery on that side. So I called it an infraclavicular, but in reality it was kind of like, you know, find the nerve somewhere between um, super inclavicular and drop local around it and it seemed to work and she got good relief and I was able to reduce it and send her off to ortho. So I hope you like this. Again, I tried to stay within the time frame. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, there's many, many courses, many, many podcasts out there on doing these in the ER. Uh, ultrasoundpodcast.com has many of these. Uh, five minute sano, meaning the numer numeral five, sano.com. Jacob Avila is awesome. He has a bunch of um, podcasts out on peripheral nerve blocks in the, in the ED, as well as his critical care um, as well. There's a number of companies. I don't want to mention any names or anything on the pay companies. All these podcasts I've mentioned are free and they're outstanding. And you can search and use them, but there's many companies out there giving cadaver courses, etc. Highly recommend you learn these. They're very easy. Once you do a few, you'll wonder why you haven't done them um, all this time. So again, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm open for any questions.